So I'm just very blessed to be here, and I want to thank Pastor Matt for inviting me, Brother Rob and them for, and, and Angie coming up here with me and helping me out. And so uh, I'm just so thankful to be in this house tonight, guys. Uh, for you that don't know who I am, my name is Ben. I'm a third-year Bible college student, and uh, I've been coming here for a couple years now in a row with Brother Larson, the minister, and Brother Bob and Sam. And so it's just a pleasure to come out to this house and just to worship you guys, just to be with you guys. And I'm just so glad that we can come and uh, glorify Christ together, right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So... Um, as I was, uh, as Pastor Matt asked me to pray and see, you know, asked me to come preach, I was like, man, this is great. This church is awesome. I love it. The people didn't think that I was honestly going to get an opportunity to preach here. So it's just a blessing. And uh, if we can open up our Bibles, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 2. So if you can, uh, when you get there, you say amen. You get your Bibles. I'll be reading out the New King James Version, so you guys understand. No. <clears throat> We're there. Amen. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 2. Amen. So, uh, the title of this message today, the Lord put in my heart, is The Secret to an Overcoming Powerful Christian Life. The Secret to an Overcoming Powerful Christian Life. Now, I know that this is a church that preaches the message of the cross, and we it, very in-depth. This church has a very broad understanding of it. And so, uh, you know, when I when the Lord gave this to me, I was kind of like, Lord, like, you know, do you really want me just to preach to people who, in a sense, understand this? They know this is the truth, and they know the truth. They hear it preached every single week in and week out. They listen to what we hear over at Baton Rouge. And so I was like, why, you know, why this title? Why this understanding? And so really, the Lord directs my heart in this uh, direction. And so I just want to kind of, before I read the scripture, just kind of give you guys some points about really what I feel the Lord, the reason why God had me give this message to you guys. So it's uh, God desires for us to live in the realm of this new covenant. Amen? Amen. He desires, it's his greatest desire Amen. for us to live within the realm. In other words, or underneath the umbrella, if you could say, of the new covenant. His, that's his grace being given to us, the victory, that now, his victory that becomes ours, the very life of Christ being manifested in us and then through us. The unfortunate truth is that many people who have received the born-again experience are not living this life the way that the Bible describes. In fact, they are living beneath the promises and the victory of Christ. And we know that this is really the, the state of the modern church that we would see in the United States. That, that you know, that we're, they're living, we're living so far beneath what God has designed for his church to be, where he's designed us to be, how he's designed us to operate. We're, we're relying so much more on man-made efforts than we are the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, yeah. God, in His ways. And so, right. the, like I said, the unfortunate truth is that many people are just living beneath the promises of God. Uh, there are those who've experienced and understand and get this. There are those who've experienced the power and the reality of this new covenant and have become idle and comfortable in it. They've allowed themselves to say, well, God, I've gone this far and I'm comfortable where the ground you, you've given to me. Like, like, you know, like King David, uh, Joshua, when he was dying on his death, but he, what did he say? There's much more land to conquer. And so Joshua wasn't satisfied, but the children of Israel were satisfied where God had brought them. And God said, no, the whole territory is yours. This whole land that I have given to you belongs to you, but they were content. So there is a group of people who, in a sense, like I said, you've experienced the power of God. You experience his presence. You experience the grace of the Lord, the effectual working of the spirit through the faith in Christ in the cross, but yet it's easy sometimes for us to grow, like I said, just I'm comfortable in that, like, man, I kind of got this. I can kind of coast it now, you know, I can just, you know, well, my faith's in Christ in the cross and I don't really, you know, I, I, I won't pray today and I'll, you know, maybe I'll pray next week and, you know, and I'm not putting law on you, you guys know this, but just the understanding of that, it's be easy to become relaxed, comfortable in this relationship. And so the Lord longs for us to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to not become stagnant in our faith. And so, and then honestly, there's a third category of people, people who, who are honestly, they're experiencing the reality of this covenant. In, in this moment, you're, you maybe in the last, God has revealed it to you and you're understanding the message of the cross. It's just becoming so real. It's life to you. You're just absorbing it like a sponge. And, and yet I, I would tell you to press in, continue. Don't stop where you're at. Don't, don't stop hungering and thirsting after what God has given to you, the truth, the bread of life. So the, the message that I'm going to preach today really applies to all of us, whether whatever category, and, and it applies to a person. If you're not saved, here tonight, then we need to get you saved. You need to get born again. And you can understand with this covenant all that Christ has to offer. And so, so this applies to all of us, every single one of us. So I just wanted to really lay that down to understand that this is for me and anybody else and everybody in this place. Amen? Amen. So we're going to get into the actual word and I'm going to read this. 
scripture today. And so again, the title of the message is The Secret to an Overcoming Powerful Christian Life. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. And so the words say, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Amen. So, uh, if you guys come and just pray with me, pray with yes, me, pray Lord. for me, that God will just come and just give us understanding and help me to really portray what he's given me. So, Father, we come before you, God. We, God, I, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this evening, Lord, and for the truth that you've given to me, to these people. And I thank you for the people that are here, God. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would come and he would open up our hearts, open up our minds and our understanding to grasp, Lord, to truly grasp all that there is found in Christ, God. You have paid such an immense and great price for your children to walk in the power and glory of God. You've paid a tremendous price for us, Lord, to have all these promises. Lord, do not let us fall short of what the church should be, God. Don't let us fall short of what the normal Christian life should be. God, help us to attain, God, the reality of the promises of of the new covenant, the reality, Lord, of the message of the cross. Help us, God, in this moment, Lord. Let revelation knowledge come forth in this time, Lord, and let the Holy Spirit come and let Him speak, God. Let Him come and do the work, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. So, I just want to take you all, if I could say, on a, on a journey with me, so to speak. And, and what I mean by a journey is I just want to kind of give an explanation of, of really this proverb and, and through a, a story, through a personal story. And so, uh, uh, like I said, this applies to us, all of us, no matter wherever you're at in your walk with God, no matter if you're on the mountaintop and God's just giving you revelation, if you're just, if you're just outright struggling, you just don't get it yet, or if you're in the middle, kind of like, man, I remember at that one point I was there, but I just kind of, like I said, I become cold, I become stale. And so uh, uh, there, there's a time, and it's so understand, there's a time for all as believers that when you were first born of God, born into the family of God, the day of salvation, it was a day like no other. Amen? Can, yeah. can any of you remember the day yeah. when you yeah. came and you gave your life to God? This The born again experience, there was a change in the inside, yeah. man. It wasn't an outside thing. It was God came and he changed you from the inside out. Your desires change. Your thoughts change. Your affections were no longer set on things of the world, but the things of God. Yeah. And God turned all your desires from worldly things to after him. <laughs> that is the born again experience. And so and, and, and that's everybody in this room, for the most part, that I would think has experienced that. And so. So once again, if you, uh, you've truly been born again, all these things have passed away and become new. Desires change. Morals begin to align with the word of God. And so without a shadow of doubt, we all know in that moment, you know, man, I've been saved. I'm a changed person. I can't. Maybe you weren't able to explain all of it, but you knew there was something different about this Christ who came into my heart and changed me and took me as I was. And so I, as a second, I'm, I'm thankful for that day. So now I do believe this. To be an understatement, okay? I do believe this statement I'm about to say. It is an understatement. Just because you receive Christ as your Savior does not mean that you know how to live for God automatically. Right. Amen? Yeah. Right? Right. right. We, you know, even the Apostle Paul, right. let's, you know, if we want to talk about him, he, he got saved and then he was in the desert. And what had to happen? The Lord had to teach him. You know, how to teach him everything that, how to live for God. You know, he understood faith in, in Christ and salvation, that Jesus Christ was the Lord and he was preaching that, but he didn't necessarily know how to live for God. And we see the Romans 6, 7, and 8 experience, the Romans 7 experience specifically, when he walks through that time in his life where the struggle of, and the warfare between man, like, why am I doing all the things that I don't desire to do? A man that was genuinely saved, that genuinely loved God. So once again, just because I've received the Lord doesn't mean I just now know all of a sudden, it's just immediate. Man, I know how to walk in this. This is a... Can't, you know, uh, it's a walk in the park. It's easy, you know, and it's not like that. Let's just be real. Christianity is not like that. So, again, there's, and really, and this is what I notice in my life and many others that I talk to, especially those that I walk in the Bible college, we have a lot of conversation, theological conversation, I guess you could say. And so, uh, in fact, there always seems to be a time of struggle or even failure in the life of the believer when you first come to God. It's that first experience, oh man, it's great, everything's good. And then here comes that first trial that kind of knocks you back and that first failure, you're like, Man, like, I failed the Lord. Like, I didn't think that was going to happen or that. You just, something just, you're like, wow. I didn't know I was capable of even going that way. And then you find yourself in this constant 
struggle and this cycle of, man, like, what do I do? And, you know, again, we, we know you what, know, you know, modern church tells you to do, you need to pray more. You need to get in your Bible more. And, or if you want to say this, the, uh, I call it the neo-Pentecostal church, and it's really just the new, it's a new age doctrine that's, that consider themselves Pentecostal. They teach that, oh, just remove all negative sources in your life. And you'll get the victory, right? These are, these are all sound like good things. They sound good to the mind. They sound right. Yeah. But how many of us know that the Bible says that God uses the foolish things of the world to Amen. confound the wise? He doesn't operate the same way he, we operate. He doesn't operate the same way human mind and our intellect and thinking would operate. He operates the opposite way, in fact, to prove to us that his wisdom, and the Bible calls his wisdom foolishness, actually, is greater than my wisdom. So God's foolishness is greater than the wisdom of man. That's the idea of what he's saying. So God uses the opposite things really to confuse us, but to really us to see like, wow, this is a really a great God. Because I thought I had it all together and I was completely wrong. Amen. So again, like I said, you're, you know, we've all been in that place in our life. And so, uh, you know, like I said, you try to do things, you're working, 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 and it's just not working. You're failing over and over again. And you're, right. and, and really you're losing strength and right. you're losing that strength over. And it just, every time, every day is just, it gets worse and it gets worse. And you feel that inward side, like, man, like, is this even worth it anymore? I'm just so tired, so weary. And, and, and so, like I said, uh, excuse me real quick. And so you, at this point is when we've been to realize that what our, our strength is not capable. We realize right. that my ability, I, I can't do it. And, 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 and really God gets us to the place where all that's left is for me to cast myself on Christ. It. It's for me to come to the feet of Christ and be like, Lord, I let you literally lose all confidence in self right. to accomplish, to do, yeah. to be. Because you realize, man, I can't. It's not in me. It's, I'm not capable. This I've tried it. I've done it. And I've every time I've fallen short. And we cast ourselves at the feet of Christ. And it's at that moment that, and I love to say as I've heard it so many times, that desperation precedes revelation. That God's going to allow you to get to that point of where you are like, my God, like, Lord, I need you so much. And at that moment when he sees, he's no longer relying on self. He's completely, he's given up. He's tired. He's weary. His strength is gone. God says, now let me show you how. Son, and you'll, you'll and like I hear, you know, I, I said it. I'm like, I remember saying it to the Lord when I said, God, I said, I can't do this. And right. the Lord spoke and said, exactly. And that was it. Changed my life. Right. Changed my life. Just, I was like, oh my goodness. Like that was it. The simple answer that God was trying to show me by my own work saying that, Ben, you can't do it. So go ahead and try to do it for a little while. And he lets you and lets you. And then at that moment of when it just seems all hope is lost, there's nothing else to do. You really come to that old wretched man experience we see in, in the book of, of, of Romans chapter 7. When Paul knows, man, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And he says, I thank our Lord, uh, God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's done it. He's delivered us. He's given us that victory. He's given us that strength. And so, again, at that moment, right there is, is, that, is the beginning, I would say, of the understanding of what we would call the message of the cross, what we call the new covenant, grace by faith. It's, it's the, and I, I use those terms interchangeably because they are. The message of the cross is the new covenant, and it is grace by faith. It, those are all the similar terms we can use interchangeably. And so I just want to say it so y'all don't get confused when I say, you know, new covenant, message of the cross. It's all, I mean, the same thing generalized. Amen. And so, um, so really, like I said, this kind of brings us closer to our text in the sense of like, what is, what is the author even talking about? You know, like he's talking about, uh, 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 the, the treasure, the commands of God, you know, incline your ear to wisdom, understanding, searching, you know, it kind of seems like, wow, it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like I got to do a lot of things to get, right? And, and, and so with what we know now, it's kind of confusing. Almost as oxymoron, like why would God ask me to do, do, do when we know that it's faith, 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 and grace, grace, Amen. grace. Right. And so this is and this is the understanding that, you know, I was like, wow, there is it seems like there's so much for the believer, too. It seems overwhelming. And so we have to have a proper understanding of our position in Christ. Right. right? right. We're dead with Christ. We're buried. We're raised. And when we're in heavenly places, seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that is our position. And from that position stems all these good works, stems these good things. And so, like I said, I'm just really repeating things that you got, that I know you guys know, because I, I know Pastor Matt talks about this all the time. I hear him. I listen to him. And so it's not anything new to you guys. So. Again, kind of coming back to where we're at. So we know our strength is failing. You cry out in desperation. Christ comes. He reveals to you the truth that you know that you can't do it in yourself. And you cast yourself upon Christ and begin to learn to rely upon his strength. So again, from that first day now that you understand that, you're like, well, I understand now. Well, again, I remember the day that I thought I understood. Once I had the, I guess you could say, the revelation of the cross and the understanding it's not in myself. And, I'll, I'll, and, and this is why this church is special to me because... It was three years ago. I was sitting right there in the same seat I was just sitting earlier. And Brother Larson was up here preaching a message. 
and at the MS, and I was dealing and battling with things in my life, first year of Bible college, and, and, and I'll never forget, man, it's like he was reading my mail, just sitting there, like, <laughs> he was sitting there, he's like, there, and I'll never forget, he's like, there's someone in this room right now, he said, who's struggling, who's failing, he said, you're here, it's your last hope, he said, you've been doing this for years, and he said, you won't surrender to the message of the cross, you won't surrender, and he said, if you do it, he said, the Lord wants you to know that the grace of God's going to flow in your life, and I'll never, I'll never forget, I sat there, and I was just shaking and weeping like a baby in the presence of God, and I just told the Lord, I said, I'm done. I said, I'm, I'm tired of this. I said, I just want the truth. And if this is it, I want it. Right. And, and what he said was true. Because everything after that was different. My life just completely changed. It's like, man, it's like, you know, reading the scriptures. I'm like, wow, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm understanding the truth of the new covenant. Understanding that I'm like, wow, I'm truly free in Christ. I don't have to be bound by all things. And it was such this brand new revelation. You know, I was eating it up. And, and, but from there, again, you, you know, it's not like all of a sudden, well, I got it. And that's it. Let's go. This is a progressive yeah, relationship. Yeah, this yeah, is a progressive yeah. walk in Christ. This is sanctification. It's a lifelong process. And so what I'm saying is you may have, and I'll say this, that when you come to the knowledge of the truth, all of your desires, and I say this, the born again experience is this powerful. All of your desires shift to one thing. That's to please God. The ability to carry out those desires is not automatically given. Right. That is what the right. sanctification process is. The ability to carry out the desire to continuously please God, to live for Him, to do what He's called to do, is not automatically given. It's a learning process. And that simple process is learning just to trust in Him and not in yourself is the reality of it. And so we like to complicate things. But that's just the simple truth that I just tend to rely upon me and what I can do in my self-efforts, even after you have this knowledge. And we do it so much without recognizing sometimes. That's the point of the Holy Ghost who comes and He convicts us, He teaches us, He guides right. us. And so... So, uh, the, uh, uh, so, like I said, so the place of revelation knowledge, right, which is at that place where we come to the end of ourselves and God reveals this to us. And so uh, it, it's really, uh, it's how to live this overcoming powerful Christian life, right? It's like almost one moment God gives us revelation and there's nothing you can do in your own strength except look to Christ on the cross. Because it was at this place, as he called out, it is finished, that he broke the chain of sin. He destroyed the works of the enemy. He nailed the law to his cross, Amen. paid for healing our physical body. And really, a very important statement is that he delivered us from ourselves. From ourselves. Yes. Right. Flesh. This, yes. this yes. thing right here. Yes. Let me tell you, you don't need the devil to be bad. You don't need the devil to sin. I'm being real. Like, 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 you know, we use the analogy. You put two kids in, you know, in a crib, two babies, you give them one toy. You see what happens, right? What, they're going to be fighting on that toy. They're not going to share naturally. You have to teach them that. What I'm saying is that we don't need the devil necessarily to sin and to do wrong and to wander off and to think that and go to that direction. That's self. And Christ defeated self just as much as it defeated the power of Satan. At the cross, same night, no, nothing changed right there. We have to understand that, man, deliverance from me, this old man, this man who constantly wars with the spirit, with the new nature, is constantly trying to battle and trying to win. And yet, if we give if we give to him, if we allow him to, because the Bible talks about Romans, reckon yourself dead. Notice, don't let him come back alive, he says. It's, it's, it's our, we, we need to be mindful of that. This old man, he's there. He's waiting. He's waiting for you to, he's waiting for you to start Put strength in yourself. So he, because the moment you begin to put strength in yourself, oh man, here he comes. He's stronger than I am, right? He is. He's stronger than my willpower, and we know that. And then the enemy plays off that. The devil plays right off of that old man, saying, "Oh, I got him now." And so, what I'm saying is that the flesh is a very powerful thing, but Christ delivered us from self at the victory of His cross. And so, right there, uh, when we see that cross in the fullness of its redemptive work which doesn't just stop at salvation, but it sanctifies us, and it's also the means by which one day we'll be glorified. This is the salvation that we have. It's, it's a complete salvation from salvation right here in the body, sanctification, and glorification. All the way through. God, the same, the, the work of the cross redem is, is full redemption. And so, now, if I want to kind of go to Proverbs, if y'all want to take notes, if y'all are turning there, I'm going to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And so I just want to kind of explain all that to kind of give the idea of like, well, hey, like once again, it applies to all believers who are where? That they're either not saved or they're just barely saved struggling and or you're in the middle or you're living in this and God's telling you just keep going. Keep learning this truth. Right. And so that's why I just want to explain that quick story. So now Proverbs chapter one, verse seven says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, the first thing that we must understand one of the first three things is, what is the fear of the Lord? What is the knowledge of God? And what is the wisdom of God? Right? This is a very important thing. And so, first of all, I'm going to just kind of give you some pointers on what is really the fear of God. You know, we, there's a lot of 
stuff out there, you know, like, you know, are we terrified of God or, you know, is it just kind of like a respect for God? Is it love? What, what does it really mean? Well, there's several different things it could mean. And uh, the first one I would bring is uh, hatred of sin. It's hatred of what God hates. It's sin, right? We don't hate people, but we absolutely do despise sin. And it's wrong. Why? Because it's against God's nature. It's against yeah. his very character. And Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way, the forward mouth, do I hate. What else is fear of the Lord? Well, it's, the, it's blessings for the believer. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. What else is it? It's the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It brings souls into the kingdoms. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, this is right after Saul was converted. It says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee, Samaria, had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it multiplied. The fear of the Lord produces comfort of the Holy Spirit. It produces multiplication in the church, souls being added. And so, uh, what else? It's peace in time of trouble. And it's also wisdom and knowledge, which is found in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6. And he will be the stability of your times, which means peace in a difficult time, abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure, the fear of the Lord. So we're kind of like I said, I want to really hammer this point down about what the fear of God is. And, and I, this is the kind of definition I came up with is it's an understanding. It's understanding the value of God and all that he's done for us, weighing that value on a balance to see that his words are perfect and trustworthy. So and so simply, you respect God for his worth and completely trust him with every aspect of your life. The fear of God is literally just saying that I look at him, I'm in such awe of who he is, his character, and I love him so much, I respect him so much, that what am I going to do? I'm just going to trust him with my life. Right. Yes. Every aspect, right. everything, every direction that I'm going. This is what the fear of the Lord is. It's simply trusting in Christ with my entire life and my entire being. Secondarily, we need to understand what the knowledge of God is. Knowledge is really just uh, is perception or intelligence, but in reality, it's facts, information, or skills acquired by experience or education. And so I know this is a little more of a teaching session than preaching, so uh, I'm sorry about that. But uh, anyways, so again, knowledge, what is it? Facts, information, skills acquired by experience or education. So the born-again experience, uh, that's an experience. The knowledge of God, what is knowledge of God? Knowing him, who he is, his character, who he is to you. Well, at the beginning, when you first got saved, what happened? The Holy Spirit came, convicted you, showed you need a savior. You accepted Christ and you had the knowledge that he's now my savior. He's my deliverer. He's set me free. He's healed me, right? And so now you know God in an experiential way. And then secondarily, it says that it's also uh, through education, which is the word. The word is what educates us on who Amen. God is to us. It's the knowledge. So the knowledge of God comes twofold. It comes by experience and by the word. And by the way, the experience never outweighs the word. <laughs> it never outweighs the word. Just because someone says that, you know, that we can take our jackets off and hit people when they get slain in the Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say all of it's wrong, but look, I'm just saying, <laughs> if it don't line up with the word and the character of God then I'm, right. I'm not taking the experience. I don't care how many people are getting healed. If they're not preaching correct doctrine, something's not right. Amen. Something's wrong. It has to line up with the Word of God. Experience yes. right. never trumps doctrine, never trumps the Word. Good. So, knowledge of God comes from experience and education. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. This is a very important scripture in our study. Is The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a very common verse. The fear, uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so I really want to break down this verse. So the knowledge of God as the Holy One is knowledge of His covenant, right? His new covenant. So okay, I'm going to say it again. The knowledge of God as the Holy One, as Christ, as God, is knowledge of His covenant because that's the only way we can experience His holiness. The only way we can experience holy living and growth and grace is by understanding Christ through his covenant. Understand that. So I can't just come to Christ and say that I know him. Well, you need to know his character. You need to know who he is. You need to know exactly what is he what has he done? What is he here to do for me? In a sense, right? Well, he's here to deliver you, set you free. He's here to strengthen you in time of need, to give what we need is what he's our provision, our provider, right? That's these are all things that are found in the new covenant to right. us that as new covenant believers, this is available to me and you on a daily basis. If I want it, and I'm going to get there as far as like who does it, who does it apply to. But uh, so again, so the, okay, knowledge, right? Knowledge of God. So 
the knowledge of God and his covenant is what I'm really trying to get to in this text. That it says, when it says in Proverbs 9 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's really saying the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding through his covenant. The only way you can understand Christ and his holiness and his goodness is through the new covenant. It's through his covenant. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. So first we talked about we talked about the fear of the Lord, which is a simple trust in the Lord. Cast yourselves upon the Lord. Believe him with all your heart. Then we talk about the knowledge of God. It's not just like, oh, I know of him. No, you know him in an experiential way. And you also uh, know him in the way that it says that through his covenant, who he is to you. Who he is to by By the cross of Christ, but first by his incarnation, Christ coming down to the world and being human. He related to us, and him taking our place on the cross now made him relatable to me in every way. He took my place in sin. He destroyed self again. The, the law was nailed to the cross, it says. And so Christ is relatable to us. So now that we have the fear of God within us because we're saved, it's initially given. Then the knowledge of God by the born-again experience is also given. And then you begin to be educated by the word. And now you have knowledge of who Christ is by his covenant. Like, wow, he's a redeemer. Man, he's a sanctifier. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He's he's all these good. He's, the Bible says he's all things to me. Yes. Yes. All things to me. So yes. we're starting to see Christ in a more, just a more awesome, broad, deepening way. And, and so again, you can't just have educational knowledge of God. And so this is where something I really want to talk about is that educational knowledge of God. What does that mean? Okay, you must have an experiential, experiential knowledge of Christ and His covenant. Yes. And this is where I talk about. There's so many believers. Right, and I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people who don't understand the message of the cross or don't know what the new covenant. I'm talking about believers like like ourselves here, who God has given the privilege to understand, open our hearts and minds that God has given you this knowledge, right? And He's given you, but yet you have an. Edu it's more or less an educational side. Mm -hmm. It's head knowledge. Like, well, man, I can look, look, man, I can sit here and I can, I can, I can quote the. I'm in Bible college, you know, we can quote the message of the cross to you verbatim, and but it doesn't mean at all. That I'm experiencing the power of it. It doesn't mean at all that I'm walking in the reality of it. And and I, and sometimes I do fear that a lot of times that we take that because I know it means automatically that I'm going to walk in it. We think that, you know, there's no, in other words, like, well, there's no application, right? Well, we say we apply it by faith, and I agree with that. But we have to describe what faith really is. Faith is not just saying that, I believe God, right? What, what did God tell Abraham? He said, Abraham, he said, get out and go. And what did Abraham do? He believed God. It was kind of righteous. But what did he do? He went out and went. He left. Because he true. So biblical faith, biblical faith, real faith, has movement to it. It doesn't allow you to stay stagnant. It doesn't say that, well, I believe and now I'm just going to sit here and absolutely get nothing and receive the promises of God. It's nowhere found in the Bible. Noah believed God. And what did he do for 100 years? He built an ark and he preached. He built an ark and he preached. He believed God. And so there's different places in the Bible we see that real biblical faith produces something. Amen. If it doesn't produce something, it, I can sit here and tell you, I believe in the cross of Christ and I believe and I believe the message of the cross, but if it does not have the product of holy living, if it does not have the product of me glowing closer to Christ, if it does not have the product of me having a desire to see soul saved or to become more just like Jesus, my friend, you haven't believed yet. Amen. You haven't believed. It's a hard truth. I know it's not easy to accept, but it's the truth. It's the biblical sense in that biblical faith will produce something. Amen. If it doesn't produce anything, that means it's dead. It's not alive. It means you haven't had a, either one of two. Either you haven't had a born again experience or you're just stagnant in your faith. And you're like, I'm just going to be here and I'm good. I don't want to go on. And so we have to understand we cannot just have an educational knowledge of this truth. God does not desire for his children just to have a knowledge, right? That's not, that's not the issue here. The thing is that many of us have, and Paul talks about it in Timothy, he says that, and this blew my mind. He said that these people, he said they're ever studying, but never come to the knowledge of the truth. What does that mean? It means that, man, I can sit here and I can sit here and pick this thing apart and tell you in and out, all the ins and out of the message of the cross and the new covenant. But man, if all it is is just up here, it's doing more of a harm than a service because that person becomes self-righteous and religious. And in and, and reality, who, who, who did Christ despise most? And I say it. Who did he despise was, was the Pharisees, religious people who had so much knowledge and understanding, but they never came to the knowledge of the truth that Christ was the Messiah. Amen. Because they were so blind by their self-righteous thinking, I know it. And so it's possible for us to get in that place where we just learn so much and we're like, I'm okay. I don't need to learn anymore in a sense. I know it and I'm okay now. And that progressive revelation stops. We begin to frustrate the grace of God in our lives. We begin to, it stops flowing freely the way that the Bible wants it to in our lives. So 
again, I want to hammer that. We cannot just have an educational knowledge. We have Amen. to absolutely experience the reality of this truth. It's working. It's real. It's alive. It's so real. Yes. It's so alive. God desires for you to walk in such levels and depths of his covenant, of this message of the cross, that it would blow your mind. God's no respecter of persons. He, he doesn't care who you are and how much education and knowledge you have or how much you don't have. He's looking for a willing heart. Amen. He's looking for a person who fears him. Who knows who he is and then says, you know what? And as the scripture says, where we get to, now I'm going to apply what? my ear. I'm going to incline my ear to wisdom. I'm going to hear what he has to say and apply it to my heart. So so we got the first two things. Fear of God, uh, the uh, uh, the knowledge of God, and now the wisdom of God. And this is my favorite one because uh, the wisdom of God. If we can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. I guess I'll wait for them to get up there. So some of y'all want to wait. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now I'm going to read through verse 25. So, it says, For since, and I'm reading again, New King James, King James, New King James, so I'm reading New King James right now. So, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek out the wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, what is the wisdom of God. I'm not talking about just wisdom, which is practical application of everyday life. In other words, you can have wisdom in how to run a business or have wisdom in, in how to raise your kids or whatever it may be. Wisdom how to do things. That's, that's general wisdom. We're talking about the wisdom of God. What is the wisdom of God? And so we know that according to these verses in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul directly states here, the wisdom of God is preaching Christ crucified, right? The new covenant. How do I know this? Well, the wisdom of God is Christ sending his son to die on a cruel rugged cross to save all of humanity. And through the cross, he would redeem all things back to himself and restore to us what we lost in the fall. Amen. Through that cross, he would institute a new covenant based on better promises. And again, through that cross, he would give us the answer for a victorious vibrant Christian yeah. life. Yes. This cross that he's talking about is the wisdom of God. It's the before the foundations of the world the lamb was slain. We see it in the garden Eve when he in Eden when he spoke to the serpent, spoke to Eve and said that you'll bruise he said serpent you'll bruise his heel but he's going to bruise your head. Speaking right. of to, right. when Christ right. would come and he would destroy the works of Satan at Calvary by the blood of Jesus. That's why we can say Satan the blood of Jesus is against you. That's why the right. Bible says that right. we've overcome him by the word by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb. Yes. The blood of the lamb has conquered right. Satan. He's right. defeated. This is the wisdom of God. It's not a wisdom. It's not part of it. It's the, the wisdom of God. Right. It is the. There is no if, ands, or buts. The wisdom of God is Christ sending his son uh, in this world Amen. the way that he did in the likeness of man flesh to die and to redeem all things. Right. Not just one thing. Right. Not just thing. All things. And heaven and earth, it says in Colossians. All things now have been redeemed to him through the blood of his cross. Yeah. And so, if I believe in that, well, guess what? If I die with Christ and I'm raised with him, yes. well, that means that who he is and all that he's accomplished has been given to me because he's in me. So we hear the term in Christ. I'm in Christ, right? right. What does that mean? Right. And he's in you. It means that the victory that Christ has won literally belongs to you. Most, mo but, but the fact is most of us don't really believe it. Sometimes, and like I said, it's an we, we say we do. But then here comes the enemy just ravaging our lives, Amen. destroying our kids, you know, and if you want to put it on a national scale right now, destroying our schools, destroying our colleges, destroying the moral of this nation. And the enemy's just reaping havoc all across this world. And yet believers are sitting here and the Bible says that we have all power and authority given to us in heaven and earth just like Christ did because I'm in him and he's in me and he's given me the keys of the kingdom. But yet it seems that it, as if the body of Christ isn't gaining any ground. We're losing ground almost it seems like. What, what's, the, what's wrong here? We, we, we're failing to realize what we have. 
We're failing to realize who we are in Christ. We're failing to realize what he really did. At Calvary, we're failing to realize the power of the blood that's found in him. The power, the power that's found in the authority of his name. Right. In his name right. alone. Right. We've been given that authority. And then also, and this isn't in my notes, but you've been given the authority of dunamis power. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you've been right. baptized in the Holy right. Ghost, God has given the authority of his name. And he's given you the dunamis power, the miracle working power to do what he's called you to do. My friends, what I'm saying is we're fully equipped. We're fully equipped. This church is fully equipped to reach the lost. It's fully right. equipped to bring right. people in. It's fully yeah. equipped to, for people yeah. who are struggling to come in and for them to understand the knowledge of truth and come out not struggling anymore. To know this truth. This church is equipped, but do you know that? Do you know truly what you right. have? Are you living the vibrant life that Christ wants you? Are you living in the victory that Christ has truly paid for? Are you living in just that? And I say that it's not that you're not going through things. No, you're just walking above those circumstances right. because right. you know who Christ is. And you know, guess what? I'm walking through this fire, but you know what? He's going to see me through just like he did the children of Shadow, Meshach, and Abendo. Abendigo, I walked through the valley of shadow of death. He says, I am with you. In other words, we know who our God is. Based on an experiential knowledge of him, we have fear. In reverence and respect for him so much And then that, that wisdom What is that? That the victory has been given to us It's applied already And we take that and apply that to us And those three things The fear of God The knowledge of God And the wisdom of God This is a cycle I was talking to one of my friends about this last night And we were just sitting there talking It was just coming to me I was like wow this is amazing You know He was really on point Just confirmation for what I was going to talk about The fear of the Lord The knowledge of God And the wisdom of God These three things I believe No doubt in my mind that most believers, we really don't understand how to put them all together. We, we, you know, we understand bits and parts of it, and we may have it up here, but it's the application. It's the walk in it. Yeah. It's it, it's it, is it working and living in my life. So, again, how do we apply all of this, right? And the simple answer it is faith. It's faith. I, I will say that it's faith. And I, 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 I never would argue and say it's not faith because it absolutely is. But... I'm gonna, I want you to hear these words. So now we're going to get into the actual text of Proverbs, okay? So all of that was my introduction. <laughs> now look, it's going to go quick. Trust me, this part. So I had more notes on the introduction than it at the end. So, um, but, and so Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. So again, hear what the Lord is saying. He's saying, my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. What is, what is he simply saying? Just saying this, hear the word of the Lord today. Hear it, listen to it. And that word treasure means to store it in your heart. Store it in a place right. Right. as if someone was trying to come to rob it and right. they couldn't find it. So take those commandments that God, the things that God has come and commandments are what? Not options. We know that. The commandments are not options. Take those commandments, store them in your heart so far, so deep that the enemy can't ever come and rob them from you. They're in there. Then he Amen. says to what? Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. What he's saying? Position <laughs> yourself to hear from God. Right. You've got to position yourself to right. hear from him. Right. You know, you can sit all day and say, I believe, I believe it, Pastor. I believe it, Pastor. I believe it, Pastor. But when you're at home and five days a week and you're not at all positioning yourself, anything the pastor just said, and you wonder why the circumstances in your life are just going crazy and you're not having a big, well, there's a reason. You're not inclining. You're not positioning yourself to hear from God. You're not positioning yourself to hear what? The wisdom of God. He says, incline, incline your ear to wisdom. Bring it close. Well, what's, what's an application of that? Well, See, asking, ask the Lord. Because the next verses say this. It says that if you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you Amen. seek her as silver, search for her as for hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Amen. Lord and find the yes. knowledge of God. Oh my goodness, what is it saying? You mean I have to ask the Lord? He's just not, yes. So it starts with desire. Desire. If there's no desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, we know that God will not force himself upon us. Right. He'll convict you. Right. He'll right. deal with you. He'll call you. He'll, the pastor will preach a message. And you know he's talking to you and you're just kind of like, yeah, I mean, maybe that's for the person over here. You know? So in other words, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we have to have a desire, inward that's desire. Right. God, I desire to please right. you. I desire to know you. I desire to live in the power of your spirit in the realm of this new covenant. I desire to know the message of the cross. I desire to want it to re be real in my life. A living reality, not just words, but me walking in it so that people can truly see it. So we have to ask God given this revelation the same day that you came to salvation. All you did was say, God, come and save me. Change me. You just cried out to him in desperation. And what did he do? Immediately the Holy Spirit came in that act of faith and he changed your heart and life. It's no difference for understanding, for, for wisdom. It's no difference for God giving you revelation for victory over sin or maybe revelation for a certain problem that you're facing that, that's unique. You know, Whatever it is, we have to position ourselves to hear from God and then say, God, give it to me. 
And he may be, hey, guess what? Day one, it doesn't happen. But day two, you come back. And you say, Lord, God, I need this. And day three, and day four, and day five, and day six. And, and before you know it, you know, all this accumulation of asking God, the Bible says God won't deny a heart. You know, he won't deny those who are seeking him, those who are crying heart. Blind Bartimaeus. Have Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It was a desperation of yeah. pride that right. if I don't get this now, right. I'm not going to make right. it. That's what God, That's what we're trying to portray yeah. in this proverb that, my friend, that we say, well, yeah, I, I do want to live this life in Christ. I do want to live a powerful Christian life. I want to be on fire for God. But do you really want it? Is there a desperation in your heart that you know that today, Lord, if I leave this house without that thing that I'm seeking, whatever it may be, that's godly. It's a godly desire is what I'm saying, not not flesh things, you know, like I want a new car or something. Like, Ain't nothing wrong with that, but we're talking about godly desires here. Things of the Spirit. So that God, I desire this so much. If I don't get it, then I just can't live. And I need it right now. It's the same type of thing the Apostle Paul had in Romans 7 when he was, he, man, he you, you think that he just sat there and was just like, all right, God, show me. Man, he was in agony. He was in pain. He was crying. He was asking God, I need, what am I doing? I'm keeping the law. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. And, and through that failure, through that struggle, through that agony and pain, and just that consistency of coming to the Lord, asking, he's inclining his ear to wisdom. He's coming. He's, he's having the fear of God. Why does he have the fear of God? Because he's coming to the Lord, knowing that he can answer him. How does he have knowledge of God? Because he's born again. He's saved. And now the wisdom of God is now being imparted to him. Amen? Amen? Do we want the wisdom of God? What is the wisdom of God? The secret to live for God. It's the secret to live a vibrant. I'm not talking about some watered down Christianity. I'm not talking about just kind of like we come to church and we get let on fire and then the rest of the week is just terrible. I'm talking about that life where the life of Christ is being lived through you in such a way that the world looks and says, man, there's something about this man that he has. I want it. He's not just talking about Christianity. He's not just talking about this Jesus. He's living it. Something else is inside of him living it through him. It's not me. Understand, it's never us. It's Christ in us, but do we want that reality? That's the wisdom of God. Do we want that experience every day in our lives? Do we want Christ to truly show us who he is, show us his power, show us his glory? In a sense, even as do we truly want revival? Do we truly want these things that God says he'll give to us? Because if we did, my friend, we'd be seeking for it as silver. We'd be searching for it with all our heart. Do you understand? Guys in the mines, what they go through, how hot it is, and how long they're down there for searching for these jewels, it's not easy. It's not hard. God... What I'm saying is, guys, God's not promising, hey, it's not going to be easy. He's not just going to, you know, he wants you, and it's, I'm not talking about earning. But what I'm saying is that you know what, it, when you get it, you know what it's worth. That's right. Because you sat there in days for days right. and ye, right. and sometimes right. months. It's been three years for me since the day that I remember opening my heart to this truth. And for three years, God has progressively been revealing this to me. And I was telling my friend Andrew Hutchison the other day, who I think he preached here not too long ago. I think it was him. And so he came here and me and him were talking. I said, bro, I said, I feel like I said, I've been hearing the truth of this gospel for 12 years since I was a little kid, 12 years old. I said, I'm 23, so almost 13. And I said, and yet I said, Three years ago, I finally gave myself, and I began, and what did I begin, what have I been doing these three years? And I've been crying out to the Lord, God, I need more revelation. He gave me an initial, because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. The beginning of the understanding of this truth. Good. It's just the beginning. There's so much more that Christ wants you to experience through his work on the cross. Do we understand that? How deep it goes, how far it goes, that there's so there are depths in Christ that we haven't walked yes, yet. Amen. There are heights in the hand that we haven't been taken to yet. Guys, I'm telling you, there is so much more than what we're experiencing. Even if you are experiencing this truth, God wants you to experience more. If you're living in defeat, he's saying that time's over. It's up to the individual. When, yeah. See, now what I'm saying is how do I know that that time's over for those who are struggling? Because the truth's been revealed to you. You're not ignorant. You're not ignorant of it. You know better. So now either you can, I can decide to sit here in the mud and just say, I'm just going to sit here, you know. Or knowing the truth now, saying, you know what? God has empowered me by his spirit. You know, all the promises of God apply to me. I'm going to receive this by faith. I'm going to seek it until it's mine. I'm going to receive it, God, until it becomes mine, until I possess it. And just like the Apostle Paul says, later on in the end of his life, he says this. He says that I have not attained that which I want to attain. What is he saying? Guess what, guys? I have so much knowledge, revelation, abundance of revelations, but I'm still not done learning. I'm still seeking the first day, that first day when I came into the revelation of this truth of Christ, who he is, all that he is to me. 
To this day, I'm still knowing that Christ. To this day, I'm still growing. And I haven't reached it yet. I haven't got to the top because there is no top, my friend. It's ever going. It's over. There's no way that we can reach the top of Christ, the depths of who he is, his work for us. There is so much more that Christ has for us. So we have to keep on asking. Not just one time. Even when God gives you what you ask for. You know what does James say? You have not because you ask not, and you have not because you ask wrongly, right? You ask amiss. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, we just, we don't ask. And, and then, like I said, we just sit there and like, God, why? It's just all. I, I know the message of the cross. I, I know it. But why am I living so far beneath what your word says I should be? Or why am I struggling? Or You, you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. There's, yeah. Because cause you're choosing to sit in that place. You're choosing not to incline your ear. God is saying that. Just ask me. It's all he asks for. Just believe. That's what asking is. It's, it's, it's an act of faith reaching out saying, hey, Come on. Are you going to give it to me? You know? And God says, yeah, I'll give it freely. Now, he gives, he, the Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A proud person is a person who doesn't think they need anything. They think they can do things themselves. Mm -hmm. A humble person is a person who's needy, who absolutely knows, my goodness, I need all that this man has for me. I need all that he has for me. If you don't come to that realization, you can't receive grace. It's a spiritual law. Yeah. To receive grace, what is grace? It's, it's everything. It's the effectual work in a price. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. It, it's God's divine ability for us to help us. It graces all things to us. Again, it's an interchangeable term that I like to use. Uh, and so, uh, but, but it's all that you, we can't be recipients of grace. We frustrate it all the time. Why? Because we're not humble. We're not coming before the Lord. We're not, we're not, we're not humbling ourselves saying, God, I'm so desperate. You're just like, no, nah, I can't do it. I want to come to the altar and say, God, help. No, I'm not gonna, or I'm not gonna bow my knee to God today because I, I can do this situation mine. I'm not gonna ask him for help on this this financial situation I'm having or the problem with my kids or just the problem with my whatever it may be, whatever situation applies to you. God is saying, Look, you just humble yourself for me. Yes, amen. Right. You just ask right. me. You give it. Right. He gives freely. He's a good father. He loves you. Yes, he, he desires for you to have these good things. And so look at, this is just a cycle, my friends, of when we, the, the caution says that the same way you receive Christ, walk in him. It doesn't change. It's no different. It doesn't become more works, more works, more works, and I get more. No, it's simple. God wants you to live in this life that he has, but it's up to the individual. Do I really want it? Do I really want what Christ has to offer? Have I, again, do the fear of the Lord, have I counted his value? Have I seen his value and said his That's and good. waited on that scale and said his value is much greater than my own and I'm going to let Christ live through me instead of letting myself live for me? Right. That's the idea of what fear really is. Have we come to that place? Humility. And so I, I'm closing right now. Sam, if you can come up here. And again, I know that honestly, I, uh, this was a, a rough sermon for me to preach as far as just kind of getting the flow and going through it. It was more of a teaching yeah, than it was a preaching. And so. I just hope that I really got my point across that Christ desires for us to live in such in this new covenant in such a way and in such depth of it, such power and strength. And so um, it's up to the individual. You know, do I want it? And again, this applies to all of us. Not just not just the person. It applies to the person who understands the message of the cross and is living in it and is a reality. It applies to the person that's struggling. It applies to the person that's not saved. Because they need to get saved and know this. Right. And it applies to the person who's just outright just failing God and just frustrated in the grace of God. I'm telling them, this truth is for all of us, man. Amen. God desires for you. And so and we can stand real quick. And so, you know, just as, as I close, you know, the things I just want to say, if you're struggling, cry out for this. Yes. Right. Cry out right. for the wisdom of God. Ask Him to reveal it to you. And it, maybe you're not struggling in person. Maybe you're just struggling to raise your kids. Or maybe you're just struggling to have... The, 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 how, to, how to do something well on your job or whatever it may be, you're just struggling in a certain aspect. I mean, it doesn't have to be sin. I'm not saying it's not always sin. Right. We struggle with things in our lives, we see many things in our lives. God will help you with those things. He's all things to you. Yes. All things to you. Yes. Don't limit God and, what, and how He wants to. You. He said it says that trust in the Lord in all your ways and all your ways acknowledge Him. Right? In all your ways acknowledge Him. Be not to you understand. Trust in the Lord. So those out there who have who have tasted of the promises of God, who you've experienced this maybe at one time, you're like, man, I remember that time that I was just God was just working and moving and it was real and I was so in love with Christ, but that seemed to just kind of it just kind of left away. And, and the thing is, God never left. I read a post about God never left. It was me. It was me that decided to walk away and go off other things. But He still never left. And He said in that right place, wait for you to come back and say, God. 
be taken back. Will you restore that fire? Will you restore the joy of my salvation, that strength that I once had? Calling God to renew the desire to pursue Him in the knowledge of the new covenant, His cross. We must live this crucified life daily. And I'm just going to close with this where it says, Matthew 16, verse 24 to 25. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He's not talking about real death. He's saying spiritually. If you say, God, I don't want me to live. I want Christ to live in me. Right. Through this wisdom that you applied. It's, it seems like foolishness. Grace doesn't make sense to us. I, I, need to, I, I should work for everything. God says, no, it's grace. It's mercy. It's love. It's the opposite of us. God doesn't operate the way we do. If, you, if we humble ourselves to that wisdom and say, God, I promise you, no doubt in my heart and life as I'm experiencing it this in my, as a young man, just understanding finally this truth that, wow, God is going to help me in that area. He is going to give me strength. And whatever my situation is, he's going to help me and deal with it. So I don't know what he's going to sing, but you know, if, if you have an issue, whatever it may be, you don't have to tell me it. It's between you and God. It's you and the Lord. He wants to deal with it. He wants to deal with me. He's here to deal with his people. He's here to speak to us and encourage us and support us, help us. If, y'all, if anyone wants to come to the altar, man, look, I'm going to pray with you guys. But look, pray. You seek the Lord. You ask him. And it doesn't stop at this altar. It keeps going. Tomorrow, I'll wake up and be like, God, give me that revelation. Give me the answer. Give me the wisdom that I'm asking for. Give me the things that I need to live this life for Christ. So I'm just going to ask if those who you know want to come to the altar, come and come to the altar. If not, then we're just going to pray and worship the Lord and sing this now.